AI in Ospol, the uh, Fusion Party meeting for 7th of February. So quick agenda for today. Uh, we do have a very packed presentation on AI at the end of the, at the end of today, but uh, we've got a number of other topics as well. This is quite exciting. This is something I'm very interested in, that Owen's very interested in, that many other Fusion people are extremely interested in. But um, we've got a few other topics as well, so I just wanted to tease the AI at the end. Uh, oh, so um, first we have a presentation from Cami though, about some upcoming submissions. Cami, are you with us? Hello, thank you so much for squeezing this in at the start. Uh, it's about lobbying. Uh, there is a um, review into Australian lobbying practices underway at the moment and submissions close in two days. I felt um, it would be could be really good idea if we do put in a submission from Fusion uh, because it actually gives us the option then of speaking later if they want to cross-examine and the reasons for people um, wanting to have a review. Uh, I'm trying to, oh, there we go. So I actually sent an email shortly before this meeting uh, to include some references. One was from the ANAU, um, which stands for the Australian National Audit Office, and that um, they say lobbying activities refer to communications with government representatives in an effort to influence government decision making to help safeguard decision making processes from factors such as undue influence or unfair competition. Governments around the world, including the Australian government, have introduced lobbying regulatory regimes. Then um, I went on and I learned a little bit more about our lobbying regulatory regimes. And there is an organisation called ANSOG, which I'm sorry, I can't remember, oh, I can't remember what it means but um, it's an article about the regulation of lobbying in Australia and that there are three steps that need to be undertaken for reform. It says, regulation of political lobbying is a significant corruption challenge for governments, but one that if done successfully can enhance political equality and improve fairness of government policy making by increasing transparency in the disclosure of lobbying activities. And then further down it says, the coverage of lobbyists required to register in Australia is confined to third party lobbyists which only comprises 20% of the lobbyist population. So they're people that you go out and you track them down and pay them to go and re represent you in parliament. This means that a large proportion of lobbyists are not covered by regulations, such as those that operate in-house as employees. So all of the big corporations will have up to 70 lobbyists on full salary in their organisations, and their job is to hang around parliament house and get in um, politicians' ears all the time. Such restrictive coverage uh, for the code of conduct fails to provide proper transparency of government decision-making in terms of lobbying by a repeat players. There's also an article, um, academic article in the Oxford University Press that refers to issues in the health industry and it says a first step to countering harmful influence is understanding it. This requires greater transparency of corporate lobbying. So there is in fact um, identified harm uh, within the health industry by um, by the results resulting from lobbying power. Um, and, well, you know, th that, this article actually doesn't refer at all to COVID, but you can see where this might have happened in COVID at times. We develop a framework to evaluate government disclosure of lobbying and show that Australians... So there's quite a lot of people who are, who are uh, proposing um, reform for Australian lobbying, and they've already written great reams about it and I reckon we could I'd be quite happy to help and do it if you want uh, pull out some Im important things and throw them together as our submission it doesn't matter if it's not our final word on the matter because if we get invited to come and present we can actually super um, charge our presentation uh, and really go in there and be part of the political lobbying review it does sound appealing to be, um, I guess, consulted further. I, I guess, um, Cami, I guess a summary of your position would be that, you know, people should be registered, like more lobbyists should be registered, um, or we should get rid of lobbying altogether, perhaps. <laughs> um, I would really love to get rid of lobbying altogether. Um, I'm, you know, people would, I mean, you know, everyone would just, pull in a screaming heap if they couldn't go around, you know, thumbscrewing politicians every day of the week. 
uh, but it really would be so much more egalitarian. Um, I, I learned, yeah, I learned uh, recently that uh, when the American Constitution was written, whoever was doing it said it had to, under all the circumstances, be done in absolute secrecy because if anyone heard that wording was being done, um, the nature of man was that uh, they would try to influence the wording in their own interests. So they wrote the uh, Constitution in secrecy. And it's ever since that they started op opening up processes for the, in, in the interest of transparency that people have been able to get in and, and be able to influence and, that, and that's really kind of affected democracy and that's happened all over the world really. So I think there seems to be a bit of a pull now to try and take it back. Yeah, I, I guess um, one point as well, um, I guess the, uh, offline you mentioned that the lobbyists often go so far as, um, you know, not just asking for certain laws to be made, they'll actually write the drafts themselves. And I guess to that point, um, you know, it sounds pretty handy to, you know, an understaffed politician if someone else is going to write the laws. Um, and so I've heard, you know, some of the Teals, for instance, um, they're saying that they don't have enough money for sufficient staff I guess, would you agree that it probably goes hand in hand if we were going to minimise the influence of lobbyists, you know, should uh, politicians be given more budget for staff to, you know, do more independent research, do, um, I guess, more due diligence, put more effort into writing these laws themselves? Yeah, I think that would be a brilliant point to make. Thanks, Owen. Uh, and you've said it all in a nutshell for me. So well done. <laughs> um, and yeah, well, I guess... Um, Deadline is uh, Friday, isn't it? For this, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. Um, anyone who wants to get involved, um, yeah, please um, email the executive, uh, include Cami. Um, yeah, your help would be more than appreciated. Uh, if anyone uh, has an objection to this idea, uh, please. I, I think this is fantastic, oh. and um, it'd be great to work collaboratively as well. So, anyone wanting to make a submission, please consider. Uh, posting a link onto our Discord so that we can um, share and review it and uh, work on these things together. Actually, um, uh, Miles, on that point, well, well, thanks for making that point because there are some private individuals putting submissions, so you are allowed to do that as well. And that also means as a private individual, you can also give a presentation at, at the time when they're doing the review. Um, so we could have a fusion presentation and individuals presenting. I probably will do, but I mean, both one for fusion and one for myself. Michael. Um, yeah, just noting like, I mean, obviously a very short amount of time to, to get something together. Um, if we were going to do that, and we do have a, uh, submission template, um, that sort of a, a, a general, uh, we generally want, generally want to follow for consistency. Um, but we'd want to keep something, if we're doing something from fusion, it would probably need to be very short. Um, and sort of just to be kept concise to make sure that we could, if we were going to we, we keep it within, uh, or that we could actually meet that deadline, um, we'd want to be making sure that those things are sort of available for review and, and things. So in such a short amount of time, that's not easy. Um, but yeah, if people are available are and able over the next couple of days, that's that's um, worthwhile. Um, I'll try to be available uh, if, if I can, if we have, if we have submissions. Um, and then just generally, I think there are, I just wanted to push back personally on the some of the things around um, uh, removing lobbying and things like that. Like, this obviously problems with lobbying should be pointed out and, and solutions, but um, the idea of removing lobbying is sort of not uh, kind of re uh, ignores a lot of the additional complexity there and um, things like that that I, I would certainly push back on if uh, that was a greater discussion, but I don't think that's where we want to get bogged down into right now. Okay. I, I think, thank you, Michael, for that. Point. Um, would you mind um, emailing me the template, please? Yes, I will. Thank, thank you very much. So, the uh, if if was there anything else you wanted to say, Cami, or are we? No, no, I'm I'm happy. Slide. For you to move on to the next subject. Um, unfortunately, I thought my other meeting started at seven thirty, but it actually started at seven. So I'm going to have to race off, and I'm I, my apologies for not being able to stay with you. All right. Well, good luck and thanks. Th thank you very much. Bye.
So um, next we have a bit of a call out for volunteering as well as a bit of a talk about why. So um, most of our activity is centered around election time. However, we do have to maintain activity in between elections. And there's a lot of things we need to do in between election campaigns in order to prepare and, and be effective. Some examples of policy development, member engagement, fundraising, outreach, and so on. And a lot of these components can be quite small and broken down into individual tasks, but they do tend to build up a little bit. And so uh, bro broadly speaking, we could have a very effective team if we had 26 people each working at about 30 minutes a week, um, 10 to 20 hours. That's a fair amount of people with a lot of tasks broken up. Um, we don't have those kind of people. So what tends to happen is that the, that same amount of hours, five to 10 to 20 hours per week will fall on a very small number of volunteers, usually single digits, about half a dozen or so. And so we, we can survive that way, but it's very difficult to thrive where our organizers uh, are put through such um, large time commitments. So what we want to do is look at a uh, kind of consistent time commitments. And so we tend to sort of cut down requirements there. So this is why we need your help. And uh, there's a few options here. And a nice way to sort of break it down is looking at uh, looking at, at this sort of three axis. So if you like spreadsheets, but you don't like people, then we've got a job for you. If you uh, aren't a fan of being organized, but you do love being people or understanding people, talking to people, we've also got a job for you. But if you love organizing and uh, administer administration, but you don't feel like you know much about politics or, or policy or any of this, then we've still got a job for you. So whatever it takes, we'll always be able to find ways for people to contribute. And, uh, and on that note, we regularly run a variety of trainings and um, both specialized in a variety of areas, but also more generalist ones. So we actually have a, uh, a next volunteer induction is 13th of February. That's next Tuesday. And I'll put a link in chat to, um, I'll put a link in chat for anyone who wants to RSVP. And so uh, this, this, gen this is a general induction where we go over some of the most common roles needed and we can help you find a place uh, Owen? Um, I just want to add to your point, Miles, and uh, what Drew was saying. Unfortunately, even if we have the best ideas, um, that alone isn't going to get us over the line. You see pictures of, um, you know, Zoe Daniel, for instance, during the last election campaign, you know, where there are, you know, 200 or so people behind her wearing her shirts. You know, they go out, knock on doors, you know, help make social media posts, tell people, um, you know, we need more people writing policy, certainly. But, you know, even with our good ideas in place right now, um, so many voters tune out, we need to be actively pushing the word onto them. Um, they're not going to turn up at our website and suddenly be convinced in five minutes. Yeah, that's right. There's a, a lot of work that goes into these campaigns, but the majority of work is in outreach and talking to people and communication. So we do have a very robust suite of policies. We always can use more development and writing in that area, but it's uh, after a certain point, then um, the policy is ready to go. And then the amount of work and effort we put into communicating it and and promoting it is really where um, where we have to think about so uh, once again, I put that link into chat for anyone who wants to, um, who, who is interested in signing up or learning more about how to volunteer and doing that training. And then we run specialized trainings as well as that general one uh, regularly, both on request, but also during campaigns and, um, and when there's a need for it. Is anyone uh, is anyone interested in learning more about volunteering or the different roles? Because we can talk about it. We've got a little bit of time to talk about it now. If anyone has any questions. No, I've just signed up for that. I, I think the induction should cover that, shouldn't it? Sure will. <laughs> That'll do. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks also, so much. Also good to note that um, there's uh, work to be done or like there's ways people can help in uh making the induction and and the processes and the way we go about things better as well so it's not just a you jump in and follow orders or, or something like that it's it's we want people to get involved and and sort of be part of making the processes and everything better as well 
there's lots of room for that. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the next item. So uh, next we have the finance update from Michael. Okay, yeah, really can go through that really quickly. Um, it's a re very quiet uh, month of January. Uh, I didn't put um, anything into December. So if someone wants information on that, we can provide that. Um, but we didn't do the monthly meeting in January. So no December, no, no December numbers. Um, so uh, just sort of general um, stuff. We've got a positive month. So twenty-two, uh, $225 in donations. That's most, again, mostly recurring stuff. And um, we have a couple of things I think that didn't get paid for. That's, that's probably about, I think the zero account, which is our accounting system, didn't get paid for in this. So we just get paid for at the start of this month. So um, we will, there's a, there's a, the, the expenses are slightly less, but um, then sort of unlike the, there'll be a bit that carries over to next month. Um, but otherwise, um, we are just profitable in this month, which is nice. Um, we're still, and you go to the next slide, just on the balance sheet, we're slowly building up the coffers again to um, to get this. We've kind of removed some liabilities or some, some like outstanding reimbursements that never, um, never eventuated, things like that. So um, that's sort of bumped up the numbers a little bit as well. Other than that, just a sort of slow trickle of positive amounts that we've had over the last few months. So that's um, that's good to see. So we'll um, be looking to make sure we're spending that on the right things and we're building that money up to for some of the elections that are coming up soon. That's it for me, unless there's any questions. What is Stripe? Uh, Stripe is the... Um, uh, it's the service that we use or through nation builder that handles all of our payments. So it's a, it's a, it's a payment gateway. So um, but yeah, when people donate on the website, it goes through Stripe. Stripe does take a little cut, um, but it, it sort of, it, it's um, that's almost, you kind of, it's very difficult to avoid that unless we're going to do a bunch of admin of receiving direct bank transfers and receiving emails and following up who everything came from and things like that. So uh, yeah, Stripe is just our, um, a payment gateway, and uh, we've been using that. We've been using that for quite some time. So that that fifty six cents in there is just it's just I just had some big transferred over yet. Cool, thanks. So, anyone who wants, uh, in theory, up to the minute information on. Uh, on the party information, things such as fundraising, as well as uh, membership stats. I'll post a link in chat. We have a, a trial website, trial webpage set up, which uh, tracks these and is uh, hopefully updated monthly. So the uh, party stats website in chat, you'll be able to see fundraising stats as well as member counts and um, uh, we'll be adding more information there as well as we move on. Okay. Now for the fun section. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'll present my section first and then um, Miles is going to talk more about, um, I guess, the methods of actually training AI. Um, but yeah, I'll be focusing on uh, policies, um, government um, ways that nations can maximize the benefits of AI. Um, so a bit of background about me. Um, I studied robotics and computer science at the University of Sydney. I graduated in 2012. Uh, since then, I've been working as a software engineer. Uh, I spent seven years in the US, some time at Amazon, some at startups. Um, and so, yeah, I want to make sure that Australia makes the most of this coming technological wave. Oh, sorry, I guess it's already been upon us. But um, anyway, let's... Uh, um, I'll clarify that um, recently the government has published this paper, uh, an interim paper about what we should, how Australia should be reacting to AI. And so this all comes off the back of, um, especially since ChatGPT was released in November 2022, um, it, it's really woken people up into the fact that all these sci-fi predictions about the future, they're finally coming true. And so, you know, instead of just making these regulations 20 years ago, when everybody was talking about what's inevitably going to happen, now it's finally happened and, you know, governments are waking up. I guess, you know, no different to, um, you know, climate action, uh, housing affordability, so many problems. Um, and yes, unfortunately, uh, 
look for a neighbor dropping the ball again. So anyway, um, in this online inquiry, um, it's very much following the lead of an AI safety summit that was held in November 2023 in Britain, where, um, Miles, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that DeepMind is based there. Um, either way, Britain has emerged as, you know, a very relevant place for AI development recently. Um, and so they came up as well with the Bletchley Declaration, which I'll get to soon, about uh, human rights and how that fits in with how we should be de developing AI. So um, let's, uh, so it, um, you'll see if you read the report, it's pretty brief, but um, something to note is it's very much framed as though AI is inevitably going to make more money for Australia and that what the government has to therefore focus on is how we can put safeguards in place, basically ban unsafe AI. And in terms of actually doing anything proactive to get the main benefits of AI, unfortunately, that's very lackluster, um, partly because of who we're comparing ourselves against. So you see in the report, it keeps saying that we should basically follow the lead of Canada and the European Union. And so, you know, for recent context in Canada, if you remember during COVID, there were uh, trucker protests that were upset about um, the quarantine laws when they were going across the border with the US. And so in response to that, the government tried to shut down, you know, these democratic protests. Um, they froze the bank accounts of the truckers. The truckers then started using Bitcoin so their custodial accounts got frozen, you know, at the exchanges. Then, you know, Canada tried to shut down Bitcoin itself. You know, this this government that has such little has such disrespect for civil liberties, and, you know, such a lack of understanding about new technology. We're now following their lead about AI, um, as opposed to they mentioned Singapore in the report. They never mentioned China. Um, they mentioned how Singapore is creating tools to help evaluate um, if you create your own AI model, how do you verify that, you know, it's safe and trustworthy and everything. Singapore is making tools. This is the complete opposite of, you know, let's ban everything. But anyway, let's move on, Miles. Um, so, yeah, one of the things they talk about as well, following the European lead, is the notion of high risk versus low risk settings. Um, and you'll see as well, in terms of risks, um, when they ask, you know, basically regular citizens what their impression is of these risks, they keep citing that um, they don't understand AI systems and also they feel that the systems aren't tested properly. And so I guess, you know, if you admit that you don't understand how it works, obviously, you know, your opinion that it hasn't been tested very well is sort of, you know, not based on much. Um, certainly, I guess, as you, if you find out more about how, you, how AI works, then, you know, that can perhaps give people some insight into, well, maybe we just can't test this part or, you know, maybe we can only test it in the field, that sort of thing. I guess, Miles, maybe you'll cover some of this later. Um, but then on the point of clarifying what's low risk, it's repeatedly mentioned by the Australian government that internal business processes are inherently safe. You know, anything that happens within a company, because like, you know, what would a company do wrong internally? You know, why do oh and laws need to exist? And, you know, as well, there's this notion that um, if something happens inside the company, you know, is it not going to get out into the outside world? What if my business is something like Cambridge Analytica? What if people pay me to, you know, overthrow a government? <laughs> you know, clearly that's going, not everything that happens you know, internal business processes is inherently going to be safe. There are always going to be these externalities, you know, the same as um, for the environment. You know, when people talk about how not, there's this nightmare scenario where AI might create a paperclip maximizer and, you know, destroy the world, look at what we already have with the limited liability corporation. You know, it's absolved of most of the sins it commits. It, you know, consumes... Um, you know, people's well-being, the well-being of the environment, or for the single pursuit of GDP maximization. We don't need to wait for this apocalypse of an AI monster instead. And so um, oh, uh, something worth noting as well, uh, just in the last two years, uh, Nevada, a state in the US, is talking about granting essentially sovereignty to corporations. 
if they have a large enough business park, then, you know, they'll be able to run the local sort of county government themselves. Um, so, yeah, this notion that, you know, anything that happens inside a corporation is fine, you know, clearly needs to be questioned. Uh, it's also worth noting, besides the low risk of, you know, internal um, processes, another low, um, a high risk situation mentioned by France, I believe, a high risk situation is emotion detection, you know, is this person smiling? And so, you know, if they're going to say that this is so high risk, then, you know, according to France, what could possibly count as low risk then? Um, France has previously tried to stifle in innovation when it comes to reviews, for instance. So if you go on uh, Google Maps and say, you know, I didn't really like the Eiffel Tower, I had to wait in queues, and there were pickpockets there, two stars. Um, France has deemed that for Google Maps to show their two-star reviews, um, that's against the law. If you're going to show stars, you have to show the stars of Atout France, their um, travel agency, because, you know, they're the ones who get to set stars. Like it's um, You'll see as well, part of the disdain for AI in France is perhaps because um, the word, uh, the term chat GPT, if you say it in France, chat GPT, it sounds exactly the same as cat I farted. So um, if you guys start saying, you know, est-ce que chat GPT va prendre mon boulot? Is chat GPT going to take my job? You know, is cat I farted going to take my job? You know, obviously they're going to resent it a bit more. Um, so anyway, uh, the last point about um, these high-risk settings and that, um, you know, people seem to think it's fine for AI to surveil students. You know, we see this quote by UNICEF, um, AI systems show promise in improving educational opportunities from early learning to virtual mentoring to school management. Imagine that, being managed, your entire environment being managed by an AI. This is what we were saying before with, you know, the Nevada corporations having their own county governments. Wouldn't that be fun? But, you know, it's only students, so who cares? I remember during COVID, there was a scandal um, when everyone had to move to online learning and people were scared that all these students would be cheating. So, you know, they insist that, you know, the student has to stay at their desk for, you know, two hours straight. They have to show, you know, move the webcam around their room. And, you know, keep in mind, this the student's room, quote unquote, it might be a shared room. You know, if I have, you know, these children in my care, why should my privacy be sacrificed? Um, and so, you know, there were all these complaints about how, you know, nobody was a fan of schools spying on them. Um, and actually, we'll get back to that. Um, Miles, let's move on to the next slide. And so, yeah, in this notion of, um, you know, spying on students with AI, it goes hand in hand with banning the students themselves from making the most of AI. And so, you know, the cameras go hand in hand with monitoring on the computer itself, you know, making sure that no other tabs open, that sort of thing. Um, and it's basically, you know, a false world being created for these students. Um, already, you know, a big component of students learning was to write these essays that might be used to, you know, get them into university, for instance. And, you know, they can get an A for writing, you know, just boring, nonsensical crap that no one's ever going to read. The only reason this, the teacher is, you know, reading it in the first place to grade it, the teacher is being paid. Imagine if the teacher was honest and told all these people, your writing's boring, I've read the same essay 20 times today, please tell me something new. And, you know, unfortunately, the whole... The basis of schooling just keeps doubling down on rote learning, no emotional intelligence, no creative insight, very little freedom. And so, you know, now that robots who are much better at doing as they're told are coming along, you know, obviously they're stealing a lot of jobs because, you know, humans are not pursuing what they're best at. If humans were given more freedom, if we were to fundamentally rethink the education system, then, you know, people would embrace. Isn't it great? This monotonous derivative part of my daily life is now being done by these robots instead. And, you know, logically that would go hand in hand uh, with universal basic income. Um, and so if you can imagine that, you know, more robots in our workforce doing essentially the slave labor that can drive the cost of living down to zero. Um, and then to get the rest of the way, we could use universal basic income. But even, you know, we don't even need to think about such grand plans. 
it's easy, you know, if you support a variation of the current system of schooling, um, the current workforce, then even then, you know, how can we admit that it's fine for me to use ChatGPT in my internal business processes, but it's not fine for students to learn to make the most of ChatGPT. It's just, you know, this sudden um, sort of drop off a cliff as soon as you finish school. Um, so moving on, oh, I should also mention um, in terms of students, um, when we were talking about the, the high risk versus low risk, um, if we think of even something as sort of benign as, um, you know, what's going to entertain me now, like a recommender system for choosing the next photo, that sort of thing, you know, you get TikTok and, you know, people become addicted to TikTok, um, the whole attention economy um, is lowering people's IQ. Um, in an article I wrote for the Non-Human Party, um, the attention economy is producing treacherous morons. Um, I made a point there that um, when you get distracted by messages coming on your phone, even if you're just expecting to be dinged, even if it doesn't actually happen, your IQ lowers on these tests. And you know, to put it into some perspective, 10 IQ points is a stronger effect than if you had smoked a blunt. Um, so... Uh, yeah, let's move on to the next slide, Miles. Oh, sorry, go back. Um, sorry, I didn't get to that. Um, but yeah, so in terms of, um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I got it. went off track in my rant. <laughs> Rights for robots? Uh, yeah, this is good. Um, yeah. And so as well, you know, when we talk about, you know, what can we ban the students from doing, there's this notion that it's, it's unnatural that um, humans can only do this with robot help. But if we think about, um, you know, banning computer vision, I, I see that, you know, computer vision is, or, you know, photos, it's essentially a good memory. And so there's a story of Mozart um, doing a similar thing for the Pope's song, Miserere. Um, so, you know, back in the day, the Pope had a song where it would only be played in his presence and so they didn't give out the sheet music to anyone else. But um, one day Mozart heard the song. Um, then he, and he ended up listening to it twice in the same day. After the first time, he went home, scribbled down the notes, came back a second time, made sure it was all correct. Um, then later he performed it and some people were saying, you know, oh, that, that, that's the Pope's song. How did you get, you know, the music for the Pope's song? Um, and eventually the Pope heard about it, summoned um, Mozart, to you know, Vatican City and actually gave him an award, um, you know, congratulating him on his, um, I guess, you know, genius. Uh, and so, you know, how can you say, you know, when we're talking about like, you know, training computer vision uh, systems like Mid Journey to create new imagery, how can you say that, you know, that's so fundamentally different from what humans do? Um, and I think it's worth noting that um, a lot of these complaints about how they're you know, taking away the livelihood of artists. Well, you know, that assumes that artists are going to remain in this, you know, GDP maximizing complicated economy where, you know, copyright law is, you know, 200 pages long. And, you know, let's say I come up with a new song and I reference like, you know, a lyric from that song and I use a melody from there. Um, you know, there are lawsuits about people um, stealing the vibe of Marvin Gaye. These have been successful lawsuits. If we continue this, um, this copyright idea that's so unbelievably convoluted and complicated, then yes, you know, it is an increasing challenge for AI to train an artist's artwork. But if we used robots to automate away all the slave labor and we move to universal basic income and zero cost of living, then you know, artists would no longer have this pressure that they need these convoluted royalties to pay their rent. They'll be able to pay their rent even if they stopped making music. And so then, um, you know, giving credit to artists is more just acknowledgement and, you know, a lot simpler. Um, and so, yeah, we see this um, uh, in this Bletchley Declaration, you know, they're not just focused on GDP maximization. Um, the Bletchley Park Declaration from November recently was saying AI should be de designed developed, deployed, and used in a way that is safe, trustworthy, responsible, and takes a community-first approach, you know, not a GDP-maximizing approach. 
you see as well, you know, with um, the Pope, the Pope has endorsed, for instance, um, what was it called? Uh, sorry. Lost, um, yeah, so he's endorsed an app, Click to Pray. He's endorsed Code with Pope, where um, they're teaching Python to teenagers. You know, compare this to what the Australian government's trying to do. You know, this view that AI is just here to maximise our GDP. You know, the, the Pope is actually trying to ensure that AI serves us, that it benefits humanity. Uh, so I would argue from that perspective, the Vatican City is doing more for AI than Australia. Um, but also... So coffee jacket maximisation. Um, maximising what, sorry? Puffy jacket maximization <laughs> works, it? Yes, it, it's worth noting, actually. I'm not sure if everybody recognises this, but um, this picture of the Pope was actually generated by Midjourney. <laughs> um, anyway, but, um, yeah, so in terms of, you know, banning everything, the Australian government's approach, um, it's worth noting that, you know, this approach so far has led to, you know, increasing problems right now um, I was reading just yesterday about a service where you can pay $15 to get, um, you know, computer generated IDs that pass the verification tests of some crypto exchanges. And so, you know, whenever we carry out a financial transaction, you know, it's reversible, for instance, and we have to pay 2% or so fee on top because, you know, fraud is so rampant. Um, people have their identities stolen. Um, and then as well, people just totally don't understand computer security. You know, when the Hartley bug happened, for instance, um, you know, some people, this was an open SSL, an open source um, encryption library. And, you know, um, one of the problems was um, once it was revealed that it was a bug, it took months for everybody to patch it. Um, some people weren't using open SSL per se, they copied and pasted the code. So, you know, it, it wasn't tracked that they were vulnerable to the same bug. And, you know, everybody had to reset their passwords, everything. Um, and yet still, you know, when people buy, you know, Internet of Things bricks, then, you know, they don't give a second thought to security. Um, and, you know, it, it's all behind the scenes. And imagine if, you know, what if the Australian government, uh, whenever we commissioned new software projects, what if they were forced to be open source? You know, if, if the government's going to pay for research, for instance, we should be able to see the research. If they're making software, shouldn't we be able to see it? And then uh, not only can we see it, we can contribute to it. You know, what if the Australian government was going to pay uh, software engineers to work on open source projects that benefit the country? It could end up being cheaper than what they're currently doing, you know, being extorted by, you know, the big four accounting firms, uh, big four consulting firms, sorry. Um, and um, as well, you know, if I care about security, I can contribute to the security library myself for my toaster. I don't have to be locked in by, you know, whatever the vendor decided to toss in there at the last minute. Uh, so moving on to the economy, Miles. Um, so the, the, some numbers for context at the end. Uh, so the government is trying to help in a way. So uh, $17 million to help small and medium enterprises learn how to make the most of AI, uh, $22 million for the National AI, AI Center, so that's researchers, and then $35 million for graduates. You'll notice though, no funding for the government itself. How come the government isn't making the most of, you know, this new trend? Um, and you'll see, you know, on these charts for comparison, how much the government is spending compared to what they said private industry has spent in 2022, you know, it, it barely even registers as pixels on the same graph. And then when you can compare this $1.9 billion private investment, if you compare that to Australia's GDP, then again, you know, doesn't even register as one pixel in comparison. Um, I would argue that besides the government doing what it can to make the most of AI, it should also be opening up investment by private individuals. You'll see Australians love taking risks. They love, you know, putting money on the horses, the pokies. You know, the government tries banning that. What if we were to relax the laws uh, so you didn't have to be an institutional investor, you didn't have to have millions of dollars in the bank to get access to startups? What if anyone, um, instead of betting on the horses, wanted to put, say, you know, $1,000 on the next AI startup instead? The funding available to Australian companies 
comes nowhere near what you can get in Silicon Valley. And, you know, we have an educated population. We have a, a population that's ambitious, that wants to do big things. Let's make the most of that instead of just trying to ban everything. Um, so, yeah. Um, before we move on to Miles's talk about um, actually training the AIs, I guess um, we can pause here. We can chat about the policies for a moment, if anyone would like. Yes, please. Do we have a policy? I'm, I'm trying to understand what we're, where we're heading with this. Uh, is this we're, we're trying to we're trying to <clears throat> get a better understanding within the party and therefore frame policies, or we do have policies and we. Yeah, so um, I made this talk mainly as about um, getting people's responses, and then I guess you know finalising some more policies around it. I, I should point out that this government report only came out two weeks ago. Um, so yeah, um, but I, I, I guess when we mentioned, um, I mentioned that I see universal basic income as very relevant in their solutions for this. Uh, I should mention that Fusion already endorses universal basic income. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael. Oh, you're on mute, Michael. Sorry. Um, just to speak to policy and and yeah, sort of your question, Joseph. Um. And also sort of comment in um, uh, in the chat from Andrew about uh, pirate policy. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, usually I've, I've had a policy report uh, in previous meetings. I sure didn't, but I can kind of touch on that. There's a lot of um, policy work to be done. There's a lot of uh, I've been calling out for people to jump in and help um, contribute to various policy and and policy work we're working on. Um, the, all I've really been able to had time to work on in the last while is um, a, a, some of the housing stuff and and facilitating the um, the a new page we have, which is fusionparty.org.au slash, slash policy underscore development. Um, we've been trying to get additional work streams up. And uh, so basically things that people can contribute to, can submit uh, suggestions on policy proposals or, dis or parts of the discussion, ideally so it's all in one place rather than scattered all over the place and lots of separate conversations. Uh, but uh, I, uh, AI policy is sort of one of the ones we've been meaning to get going on that as well. So um, on that, um, yeah, that slash policy underscore development uh, subpage, we'll I'll uh, look at getting that up soon and we can sort of start facilitating that discussion. There are a few existing policies on, so obviously, yeah, um, as Andrew mentioned, there's a lot of, the Pirate Party has a lot of um, AI policy uh, and uh, Science Party also had policy around uh, autonomous weapons. So things like um, basically anything with a anything with a trigger should be that trigger should be pulled by a human rather than uh, anything being purely designated by AI. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, as th this is that's from years ago when there was talks of um, uh, automated drones being able to fire missiles without any kind of human input. And so, um, yeah, the, there's all sorts of discussions, all sorts of different things that we should be doing. Um, but yeah, I would encourage people to um, send things to policy at fusion.org.au, use the intake form, and also uh, keep an eye on or bookmark that uh, policy underscore development page so that they can get involved in the in the discussions and and start getting some getting some stuff down so we can push put out some official policy as soon as we can. Uh, Owen, I had a few comments, but I can't find where to put my little hand thing up. So <laughs> just let me know. It's under reactions, oh. just for FYI. Oh, you said you focus on your mind. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just sort of go through some of the points there. Um, you mentioned the relative harm of uh, limited liability companies, LLCs. And uh, we're sort of con contrasting that against the potential harm from AIs. But I actually think we should be thinking about that in terms of a multiplying effect. The general oh, yeah. effect of AI is to multiply whatever it is we're doing, whether it's good or it's bad. So if you've got the great harms coming out of limited liability companies today, just let's just wait and see how that gets multiplied when they do it with AI. So, uh, and just as well, the, the, the good things that we could do could be that much better accelerated as well, but it goes, flips both ways, double-edged sword, right? Um, the, uh, it was interesting that thing you said about the, I think it was the French one about emotion detection. And uh, I'd say the flip side of that is vitally important too, which is to say that 
um, well, if, if you're detecting people, what people say, and you're just picking up on the words, then um, doing emotion detection, it might be just as bad to not do emotion detection because the way you express yourself versus the actual words that you use are not necessarily aligned. And so um, failure to detect emotions could be just as bad as doing it. Um, it's, it's a hard one to say that simply detecting that is a bad idea. Yeah, actually, um, I, I think, Andrew, I might have said it to you the other day. Um, in regards to detecting emotion, yeah, there's um, something to keep in mind for Australian courts. I recall hearing that um, in Aboriginal culture, they're used to more pausing, uh, same mm. as many Eastern cultures. And so, you know, if you ask someone a question, you know, where were you on Saturday night, you know, at 7 p.m.? Um, you know, in the English-speaking world, we're used to this notion, oh, you know, I, I was at the pub. And so if someone takes a long time to respond, oh, they're lying. You know, they're spending that time thinking mm. on a lie versus, you know, in some cultures, you're not obliged to just, you know, blurt out words. Yeah. Um, you're supposed to yeah. think first. I mean, I get what you're saying, but just as well, I mean, to not pay attention to that, to just leave that out and just leave the blanket words can can mean misinterpretation as well. I would argue it's the reason why I think these kind of things need to be incremental. I mean, in terms of looking at the different levels of risk and, and whatnot. I mean, it's all going to be context, right? So the yeah. the any anything that happens should be um, like yeah. the idea of just like switching directly to some sort of. So yeah, so the safe path might be to say yes, you could interpret the words. That's fine. Let's get the the uh, transcript of that, but never get rid of the original, because if it's ever called into question, you want to be able to go back and view that, right? So don't remove the origins, might be a rule you could apply. Uh, but moving on, um, education, I think you touched on education. From my perspective, the educators that I've heard from on this subject are, are like such Luddites. It's outrageous. I know there's a few that are really trying hard on this, but the uh, representatives of our education departments are paranoid about retaining their existing systems of evaluation and so they're paranoid the students are going to cheat and it's like oh my god come on the students you're going to send out to the world by the time they get through your three or four year degree or whatever it is they're going to be absolutely inundated with this stuff it's going to be the norm. If you're not training them to use this now in their chosen profession, they're going to arrive in the world and the people, their co-workers who've been there already will already have been using this stuff and will be way more advanced than them. So it's, a, it's, it's such a Luddite way of thinking about this from the education departments. They need to be embracing this, but in the process of that, they need to be seriously raising the bar in terms of their expectations. Like, give us your entire workings on this. Yes, we expect you to use this AI stuff. Show us what, how you prompted us. Show us how you navigated that. How did you think about this entire space? How big did you think? How creative were you? All that needs to be channeled through this. So there's that. Um, the other thing about this is I, I think we've actually had, we've, we've been, I think the population at large has been conditioned in terms of what we expect from computer systems and software. We've been conditioned to believe that the answers we get back from computers will be perfect and correct and accurate every time. But to the largest degree, the only reason that, that actually happens is because you know a team of software engineers and uh, diligent QA engineers have made sure that within narrow, never very narrowly defined scopes, which most programs are, they will give the precise and correct answers. And so we've been trained to assume that. And then when we come to a thing that's such general and open as a knowledge base that you're working with, where you can ask it anything, as soon as we get an answer back from that, and we know that there's fuzzy edges to this, just as, and just as much as if I ask you a question, I don't expect your answer is going to be perfect. I expect it to be in the ballpark. I expect to be able to question it and probe it and ask for sources. That's the same way we need to work with AI systems. And uh, people will then go, ah, oh, but they hallucinate. 
Well, mm. yeah, and no, hallucination is kind of a feature. It's also known as creativity. Yeah, actually, right? Andrew, that's a good point. When you say about questioning, um, I forgot to mention in my speech, but in this paper, the government kept um, citing the misinformation laws that are coming along at the moment. Oh, and, cool. um, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know if mm. anyone here has heard of it, but it's essentially, um, you know, the Ministry of Truth. Um, their yeah. way of dealing with misinformation is to ban it as opposed to, you know, making sure people are smart enough to question it. Yeah, so there's indeed, there's that. But there's this thing I say there about the uh, a lot of the time how you treat the answers you get back from these things has to be firstly you got to be in, you got to be in charge of that you got to frame your questions in a way that deals with how much do you care about precision and accuracy versus do you actually want a creative output do you want me to write a fancy new poem for you create an original poem for me okay that's going to be all hallucination give me a factual account of this event, entirely different question, right? And so you've got to be prepared that, and this is this is a, a rethink about how we all think about this stuff. And, and so a lot of the cases you get where, you know, people are complaining about the misinformation that comes out of these things, it's all in how you ask the question. And we got to, you've got to get used to that. And that needs to be something we address every time we go there, right? Um, in terms of one of the actually, I think, high risk, categories around AI. It's the fact that we we actually already have uh, ubiquitous surveillance in most of our cities these days. Some cities have gone way more so than others, but it's kind of everywhere. But the limiting factor, the thing that's constrained it, this thing that's stopped it from being totally Orwellian, is that it's practically unusable on the on the large scale. It's never been affordable or practical to actually view everything that happens in all of the surveillance cameras all the time. It's way too expensive to have people do that. But as we uh, approach into this new uh, world of AI that is multimodal, it understands video content, understands images, understands audio. Well, guess what? Surveillance, ubiquitous surveillance multiplied by AI is a tr truly totalitarian um, you know, Orwellian kind of a situation. That's Ooh. a high risk. I don't oh. hear anybody talking about that. Andrew, actually, on that point, um, the, the counterpoint I would say is that, um, yes, I might be spied on, but at least the people spying on me know I'm real. You, you see that it's increasingly easy to create fictional identities. And so I think all these people, you know, complaining about their privacy, <laughs> In a few years, they're going to be begging for someone to please reveal, yes, I spied on this person three years ago. I know that they're a real human being, that, you know, their identity wasn't just invented by Midjourney, you know, last week. <laughs> um, guys, I'm sure, you, I'm sure to... you guys could talk about this for quite a while. but yeah, um, We'll need to move on to the next section now before we uh, run out of time. Yeah, I'm done anyway. Okay, so I'm going to speed through my section next uh, as, as fast as I can anyway. We'll probably run a little bit over um, 7 p.m. Briz, 8 p.m. Melbourne time, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, you guys will find this interesting and edifying. So uh, in my section, I'll mostly explore some of the technical aspects of AI, including the development and um, mm -hmm. uh, methods and alignment. But I think I wanted to find some terms before we jump into that, though, uh, which would probably be pretty useful to sort of have floating around. So probably the most interesting or the most relevant term to the stuff that Owen was talking about from an economic perspective is the concept of transformative AI, which is where we develop an AI which can uh, a form of AI which can transform our economy in a similar way to the Industrial Revolution or the development of agriculture and essentially fully transform society. Um, the one of the most interesting, and exciting terms from the history of science fiction, at least, is the concept of an artificial general intelligence, which is an AI equivalent to humans. Um, another more obscure term for this is human level machine intelligence. And the term AGI kind of came about given um, to contrast with standard uh, intelligent systems, which we've had for any a number of decades now. And intelligent systems uh, are simply any any kind of um, automated Internet of Things type device which can respond to um, sensory input or data and then automatically make decisions 
for machines um, on behalf of humans for whatever reason. So traffic lights are an example of this, but um, things like automated shipping and transport, which is fairly common in, in, in warehousing, in, in mining and so on. Uh, the last term, super intelligence, is uh, a little bit more obscure. And so Nick Bostrom de defines this as any intellect which greatly exceeds humans in all domains. And super intelligence is uh, kind of kind of similar to transformative AI, but a different approach. And super intelligence is usually what we talk about when we talk about the risk from AI, the extreme risk from AI. As um, Andrew raised some really good points about surveillance, uh, but uh, the, the 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 immediate risks from highly automated surveillance, and you don't need a general intelligence for that. You can simply run intelligent algorithms. And um, arguably, you can use current generation models of AI to unlock a large portion of the risk there. Uh, so a lot of uh, this is this is a lot of this is my opinion. A lot of this stuff is as heavily researched though um, from the following slides. So to um, so to give a sort of idea of the recent breakthrough, the current model of AI are known as uses a, a, a kind of thing called a neural network, which is kind of based on the um, the human brain, which is incredibly exciting that we are now at a point where we're actually recreating the human brain in digital form, although far, far more simpler. And the way we create these neural networks is by using enormous data sets. We essentially train this neural network. And the interesting thing is that this is a very similar process to the way human or, or at least um, animalian organic brains develop over time, that um, animal brains receive sensory input and then grow and develop, and then they're structured in a similar way to neural networks. And we'll have a look at an example network on the next slide. But um, first, if, uh, a couple more points that uh, more powerful AI, essentially, you put more data into the training and you have more processes running. And so and uh, so far, there's been this fairly linear increase in the, cap in the um, raw power of AI over the last about six to seven years. And the current wave of AI really started about 2017 with a breakthrough paper called Attention is All You Need, where they pioneered the transformer method. And so that's what the GPT series is based off. So everyone's probably heard of ChatGPT, but a number of other AI models as well based off GPT um, use the, the transformer method. And so modern AI these days has advanced capabilities in a wide variety of different domains. And uh, most uh, GPT as well as other AI models today are what's called multimodal, where they're able to do multiple different forms of capabilities. And so, um, for, uh, for, for example, it'll be able to generate images as well as understand text and generate text in a way which is very, very human-like. Um, has relevant XKCD there on the side. What is machine learning? It's just a big pile of linear algebra. You pour the data in and then stir it up a bit like a big pot. And uh, it's not incorrect. It's a, a possibly a little bit simplistic, but it's it's not incorrect. So here's an example neural network, just to get an idea of what it looks like. So you, um, you, you put in your data on the left, which could be an image or some kind of sensory data. And, and then it runs, that data runs through different layers, different nodes, which are linked there, got put into different weightings. And eventually in the output layer, it'll it'll send out some kind of useful human readable input, like um, this image is a cat, or this is an image of a dog, for example. And it's a broadly similar process to, to train neural networks as well. Uh, there is a fair bit of math involved too. Uh, but it's it's all it's all stuff which is which is kind of kind of teachable with about one to two years of uh, of university or, or upper high school. So going back to the concept of transformative AI, uh, there's a quite a large number of predictions out there. So Ebok AI has um, has published a literature review of all of the different forecasts for when transformative AI will be developed. And so Owen made the point that there is a lot of economic potential being unlocked by AI right now, but um, there's a fairly broad set of uh, uh, forecasts here, which will predict that what we've seen is 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 nothing yet compared to uh, future breakthroughs which are coming through. So you can see the median time that transformative AI will be developed is around 2070 there. Um, and all of these predictions approach 100% as we get to about 2100. So I, I guess the sort of takeaway here is that um, that we can by the end by the end of the century 2100, then which is within all of our lifespans or very close to all of our lifespans, 
then we will see a complete transformation of human society and, and the human race equivalent to the Industrial Revolution, which uh, it, it might not feel it, but we're living in the most interesting century and everything is changing so rapidly. But I, I guess sort of we've never really known anything different, but things are going to transform even more rapidly. So can these trends continue? Uh, there's an interesting counter argument here to whether we will actually achieve transformative AI. And there's a strong argument to say that if we do hit it, it won't actually be using the um, uh, deep loading neural networks, which I talked about earlier. And the, um, the argument here is that the stock of big data will actually be exhausted, arguably around 2025 to 2026. And it is, is a possibility it'll actually happen this year in 2024. And so what that means is that the, um, the uh, current AI machine learning models are being trained on a large proportion of all of the available uh, unique data from humans. And so if transformative AI isn't developed by these training methods over the next 12 to 24 months, then I then we we essentially need to develop a new paradigm of AI, which is entirely possible. And there's a huge amount of research in this area. But this is um this this is a very, fairly strong counter argument to say that maybe it will the transformative AI maybe it will be towards the end of the century or significantly longer. So what are some of the risks from AI? They have a few specific significant risks have been discussed earlier, but here are some of the general categories. We can uh, look at malicious use, which is uh, essentially using current models of AI to make the current bad actors worse. And two big areas are engineered pathogens and weapon design there. Um, I guess also web, uh, automated weapons would also fall under this area as well. Um, and engineered pathogens is a very, very scary area. Uh, we, we can sort of dream up things like COVID, but significantly uh, significantly worse in a variety of areas. But there's an interesting kind of tension there with um, engineered pathogens, which is that if if you develop a um, if you develop a bioweapon which is highly lethal, then it actually won't spread paradoxically won't spread as quickly, so it won't affect as many people. Um, and and so th there's there's other forms of pathogens as well, such as one which incubates for a long time but spreads very easily. Uh, but but the, the the current research is is very much sort of a a, a a um offensive bias is the current paradigm in favor of whoever can develop some novel new thing. So sorry that was a slight sidetrack there. But um the other sort of big categories from AI is ac accidental risk and rogue AI. Um, we'll look at accidental a few forms of accidental risk in the next few slides. But rogue AI is kind of the um the super intelligent scenario where. At some point around the time we hit transformative AI or not too long after it, then there's a high chance we will also unlock super intelligence. And, and that's a point at which uh, that we, hypothetically super intelligence would look at humans in the same way that humans would look at, for example, mice or, or ants or birds. And um, many humans have very benevolent or, or, or um, caring and empathic attitudes towards animals, towards other species. However, other humans don't. So there's no guarantee that a super intelligent AI would actually have our best interests in mind. And there's a very high probability, which we'll look at in future slides, there's a very high chance that any kind of rogue super intelligence would have as its primary goals, preventing us from aligning it to human interests. So so with that in mind, it it, it should be a, um, there. there's a high risk there. And, and so depending on how high you rate that risk, um, it may be a good idea for us to actually develop aligned AI now before we develop super intelligent AI, because there's a high chance that that could happen accidentally. So um, these risk factors are mostly around accidental areas. Um, rewards misspecification refers to where we um, we tell the AI to do something and we think it's a good thing, but then later on we realize, oh, hang on, this is really, really bad. And so there's a, a few funny examples here. For example, the idea of the paperclip maximizer, let's say a company wanted to sell paperclips and, and to do that, they wanted to make really, really cheap paperclips and they wanted heaps and heaps of them so they could flood the market. And so they create an AI and be like, maximize your paperclip production. Then the AI is like, okay. And then it turns the entire planet Earth and all humans into paperclips in the process. It uh, looks at the molecules we're made of and decides that they should be rearranged into the shape of a paperclip. That would be closer to its goals. And the AI isn't malicious there. It's not necessarily 
it's not explicitly evil. It's not intentionally doing these things. It just thinks that it's just rather we were all paperclips. And so it goes off and does that really, really well. Um, goal, goal misgeneralization is a very subtle variation of this where um, let, let, let's say we we train our AI in all these simulated environments and we're like, okay, well, um, here's an AI which does really well in these in these whatever in these kind of video game environments, but let's let's let it loose in the real world because we're pretty confident that it'll be safe and it'll act according to human interests. But then for whatever reason we've missed something and now suddenly this AI we've set loose in the world, which which was quite safe and good in a video game, it's uh it's suddenly turned into the paperclip maximizer or, or or something silly like that, which is obviously bad. Instrumental convergence is more of a philosophical risk. Uh, area of critique where um, where the idea of an instrumental goal is something which is um, uh, it's it's a goal which you set on the way towards another goal. So let's say, um, for example, our paperclip maximizer is like, I want the entire universe to be made of paperclips. In order to do that, I have to, um, along the way, I have to make sure that I can never be turned off because if I turned off, then I, I won't be able to turn the, the entire universe to paperclips. So the instrumental goal of this AI is to be completely impossible to to disable, and and so this this presents an immediate immediate concern for humans who may wish to have an off switch in case the AI starts doing something bad. But the AI is now immediately trying to disable all off switches, and and so um, and so that presents a uh, an immediate risk vector. It may decide that the best way to stop humans from turning it it off is to just stop all humans. That may be the simplest way. And that's obviously an immediate concern. Now, um, there's a few alignment techniques which are used for current models of AI. And um, there's there's a high likelihood that these methods may become insufficient or, or simply deprecated over the coming few years because AI is transforming rapidly, uh, pun intended there. But um, currently, one of the popular ones is the concept of reinforcement learning and uh, human feedback. And, and this is a... Um, a very, very simple method, which everyone's probably familiar with. And uh, Google captures are actually an example of this. And so what, what you do is that AI presents what it thinks is the answer to a question. And then a human comes along and says, yes, that is a good answer or no, that is a bad answer. And anyone who's been using chat GPT would also be familiar with this as well, where there's always a little button that pops up and in uh, next to all the AI answers when chat GPT gives you a bit of text and, and the button is like, do you, is this a good answer? It, it, is this a valid answer? And so humans can tick yes or no. And if there's a no, then ChatGPT goes off and says, "Well, okay, I've got a, um, I've made a mistake here. I've got to rethink how I do it." Task decomposition is this idea that we can break down bigger tasks into much smaller tasks and look at steps along the way. And um, interpretability is 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 broadly speaking the approach to look at what the AI is doing under the hood. And as we saw for neural networks earlier. Um, interpretability is is quite difficult and still in its infancy. Um, some breakthroughs are starting to be made, but uh, neural networks are essentially a black box, especially when you have the the big models with billions of parameters. Then you're looking at enormous piles of of of, of matrices and vectors, which are, which are just rows of numbers, and and so interpretability is the approach to try and figure out what those numbers actually mean and how to make them human readable, so you can figure out the essentially the, the, the chain of thought that the that AI is going through. So how can we align AI to human interests so that AI is safe? So there's a question I want to pose here, which is uh, for everyone to think about what information would you need to either agree or disagree with the statement that uh, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. Now I want to pause here for a moment because we have that has been quite info dense and and as we've raced through quite a lot of technical points there, but um, I'd invite everyone to put your thoughts into chat or or to speak now that um, whether there is more information anyone here would like or if anyone feels confident they have enough information at the moment and if you feel confident about whether you think mitigating AI risk or should be uh, a global priority, then what information would you need to change your mind? Oh, Miles, just quickly on, on the point of um, one of the risks, is, you know, people talking about killer robots and all that. Um, mm. Another scenario, um, I guess the scenario I was most worried about reading the government paper 
is that um, you know someone else will make AI, they will reap all the benefits from it, and you know Australians could be left completely irrelevant in the new world. And so um, I guess you know how much sympathy are these people going to have for Australia? Um, you know, what if we can't feed ourselves anymore? Um, yeah, what if we just you know starve to death? So we produce other... three times our, our usage of food compared to the rest of the world. So we're not going to starve even without AI. Oh, yeah, actually, in hindsight, sorry, maybe starve is the wrong question. What if um, what if our quality of life greatly deteriorates? Oh, yeah, it's probably a better way of working. So there's a lot of different resources available into looking at these. I Some of the graphs I referenced earlier came from a company called Epoch AI, which focus on economic forecasting, research, and trends. And a very, very interesting, um, very interesting company. And they put out some very thought-provoking research. There's a number of other resources as well to uh, gain more information about about AI development and the risks or implications or benefit, potential benefits from it. Um, I put a link to Epoch AI in the chat, epochai.org, if anyone wants to learn more about that. And um, there's plenty of other websites as well, which discuss it. So Less Wrong and um, Effective Altruism are both significant online hubs for discussion of AI development, risks and safety. But uh, how? what can we do in Fusion? So there's, I think we need to think about skilling up and improving our awareness of the risks and of the potential benefits. So uh, Blue Dot runs online courses on technical AI alignment, which are very, very good. Um, there's uh, one which is starting in uh, March, I think, or, or no, sorry, late February, which actually closes today, applications close today. And that's a... Uh, a global uh, a global course and so you'll be paired up with people in Europe and America and Asia but there's also Australian specific courses from the um, uh, AI Safety Australia and they're currently uh, have applications open for a policy and governance course uh, which is uh, again starting in March and I'll put links to these in chat as well um, the the policy governance one I've I'm signing up for and I might actually possibly be running a um uh, facilitating one of the groups, but um, depending on uh, doing a time and need, I'll put some links into chat for those though. And the final one is that uh, in order to, to take practical action, you can sign up to volunteer for us. And so we need an up, a significant update to our policy on, in terms of what we actually want to do with AI. We need something concrete on paper, but also we need volunteers to help campaign and organize around better AI in Australia to um, to take use, make use of it, to gain access to the benefits and uh, participate, but also to have a say in terms of the uh, the regulation and governance of AI to make sure that it's aligned to human risks and that any a hum, a, aligned to human interests and any risks are properly mitigated. And uh, for people watching on the recording later, we'll put all these links into the um, the video description. But I highly recommend that uh, policy governance course. And so the um, the Australian version, the Australian organization there, essentially just runs localized version uh, modifications of the Blue Dot Impact courses. And so get into the Australian courses if you can. Uh, but if you miss them, then Blue Dot runs global online courses as well. And uh, our volunteer induction is next Tuesday evening. Uh, please do consider coming along. RSVP to RSVP to that on our website for the information. And we go into much more detail about different ways of contributing either through policy development, through campaigning, um, through content creation and and so on, we have um, uh, essentially we have uh, we have nearly any kind of contribution that you can think of. We'll be able to find ways that uh, you'll be able to 
learn and uh, and and contribute back to build our movement. Uh, Joseph, you had a question? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to understand the pre on the previous page. The the question that's being po posed here. Is is the question is the is the real question, do you agree or disagree with the statement below? And what would it take you? What would it take to change your mind? Or is this the, the, it's just it's just a tricky way the question's actually been phrased? And maybe maybe I'm just tired. I'm sorry, it's been a long day for me. So the, the question is deliberately phrased to be neutral. And so I um my personal opinion is that we're at risk from a number of potential, there's a number of potential X risks alongside AI safety. Um, and, and there's a wide variety of opinions. As we saw in the forecasting earlier, there was a, a lot of professional experts who predict that tr transformative AI has no more than a 10 to 20% chance over the next several centuries. Whereas there's a, there's, um, there's people online, like people like Elias Yadkowski and um, uh, Nick Bostrom and a few others who, who would probably would be who who in comparison are probably very pessimistic about the risk and the um and the speed at which we're likely to face uh, some kind of super intelligence or misaligned artificial intelligence, and so sorry to cut you off, but the way so yes, the question is framed framed in a neutral way, but the statement below it actually has a found foundational assumption in it, and that is. Mm. AI, we're at risk of extinction by AI. Yep. And well, that's a matter of opinion. Yeah, exactly. So, so the statement is very strict, very, very strongly takes the position that there is enormous risk from AI to extinction from AI. That's the statement. And, and so the question for everyone to consider is, do you agree or disagree with that? Is there a scale to your degree? Do you slightly agree, slightly disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree? But but the bigger thing to think about is what information do you need to form an opinion? What information do you feel that you need? Where do you want to learn? Do you have an opinion already? And if you do have an opinion, what information would change your opinion? So 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 people like Owen in the party are very very positive about the potential for AI and and really want to get in there and take advantage of it. Um, people like Andrew are extremely pessimistic about the current state of things and think we don't need AI to get much worse. <laughs> So uh, whereas myself, I'm sort of this is sort of in the middle. I'm very concerned about current risks, but I think that we should be trying to take advantage and, and gain gain this potential. And, and so I think um, given that our mission, our goal is about learning more and developing ideas and and taking advantage of, of new technology while acknowledging the risks from them, I think it's important that we do consider how we can learn and what we want to learn more. So, okay. so Joseph, would you be interested? Um, so, for example, would you be interested in learning more about the technical side behind our learning, learning machine learning, doing more of the I've got a fair idea about it, to be honest, uh, which which is why I'm actually not worried about being extinguished by AI. Mm. Uh, uh, that's not to say that there are uh, there are great harms that can be done with AI intentionally or otherwise, uh, and I I. I kind of goofed i think i actually messaged somebody directly but uh, uh fundamentally re regardless um of how it is you develop your ai the key thing is transparency over the data and what, what was used because frankly um I certainly we know <laughs> because a lot of our artists are very upset mm. uh we we know that that the the data being fed into these models is by and large the greatest copyright theft in this in the millennium, right? Um, so that in and of itself is a harm. Uh, not, not that we might care about too hard, um, but the the thing is uh, understanding with it how the data is sourced, what the data is, uh, and and because frankly a lot of a lot of the AI you know, this this understanding whether someone's um what what someone's emotional state or, or possible intentions are 
is predicated on the training data. And if that data is biased and there's no way to validate or, or, that, or if there's no transparency over that data, then you, very easily you can have um, biased models in there. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a lot of concern, for example, from uh, the conservative side of politics about how algorithmic bias operates against them in terms of censorship on social media. And but that but in in a, in a very absolute sense that goes both ways and all different all, all all different kinds of people from all areas of politics have been impacted by algorithmic bias, and that kind of goes back to the intelligent systems. The contrast I made earlier between intelligent systems and uh, an artificial general intelligence in that there's active harms happening now from surveillance, from data gathering, data harvesting, um, which which AI, which uh, intelligent systems more advanced and AG, AGI will will magnify. So, uh, so this, these are discussions that we need to have in more detail. I think probably from a philosophical perspective and from a policy perspective, to 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 navigate this um, this careful sort of gap between harnessing the potential so that we don't get left behind, while at the same time also trying to mitigate the the broad spectrum of harms that are possible, and some of and, and some of the risks we looked at earlier. I think it's a it's a, a policy development space. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That, that Given doesn't... that the speed that things are changing and the complexity of this, um, I'd I'd really love to hold uh, another meeting with less um, less sort of lectury content and more sort of open discussion where we share information and then ask people to, um, just like like this slide here kind of asks try and try and get people to participants to ex develop opinions and help to develop a consensus within fusion about the kind of policy position that we want to take and be unified behind yeah actually miles on that point i had been um mentioning to a few people about um putting together like a, a short video pitch that you know maybe we could use as ads um that you know clarifies to australian voters you know why what they need to be thinking about ai you know mm. how does australia make the most of it what do we have to be worried about mm. why Fusion's ideas the most relevant for Australia's future. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, AI is something that no other party, political party, is talking about <clears throat> at the moment. Lobby groups and influencers, uh, political influencers, have uh, are pretty much essentially setting the stage. So there was that enormous AI summit in the UK, and the US has put out through Biden's executive order have put out immediate regulations on AI training and capabilities development. And so the the world is moving ahead, and at the moment Australia is probably getting left behind. So we have, as I've been saying, we have the potential to be at the forefront of Australian politics in terms of our position on this, as we've, I think we've got a very we've got strong representation from a very broad set of concerns, and uh, and and stakeholders in terms of the potential for AI in Australia. So I highly encourage everyone to sign up to volunteer uh, for the party. And um, I, as I said, I've expressed an interest in holding another community meeting to hold more discussion. Uh, so that's kind of a TBD, whether, um, whether and how and what that looks like. But then also there's options to, uh, to skill up here in terms of policy and both the, the technical skills. So... Um, I guess uh, to move towards wrapping up some final points here, uh, these meetings run monthly. Uh, we do hold additional ones from time to time that are a bit more sort of discussion focused or on specific topics. Um, we have regular policy development, campaigning and training meetings. And if anyone does want to, um, does want to present at these big monthly meetings on a topic, then please reach out. Uh, and probably about two, two to three weeks before the meeting. And uh, that is a link there, which I'm not sure people can actually click, but I'll put a link into chat about uh, some of the, um, uh, a, a list of items which have been put forward before. If you do enjoy talking, presenting policy or, or, or communications, but you don't have a clear idea of any topics to talk about, then here's a bunch of um, items that have been raised. 
as a potential topic to build around. And there's a whole bunch of very interesting and, and occasionally some pretty spicy stuff in there as well. So it's, uh, I make it, it's pretty, getting pretty, pretty close to about an hour and a half there. So, yep, excellent. That's publicly viewable. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. And I guess we can open the floor for the next five, 10 minutes. If anyone does want to keep discussing any of these topics, or if anyone wants to revisit any of these slides uh, from myself or Owen's presentation. If you just wouldn't mind putting that email and the, the link to the